Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Eyes on Earth. We're a podcast that focuses on our ever-changing planet and on the people here at Eros and across the globe who use remote sensing to monitor and study the health of Earth. I'm your host for today, Tom Adamson. Landsat's 50-year archive helps scientists around the world study land change. For this episode, we're going to talk about a key piece of equipment here at Eros that brings the data from the satellites to the archive so that you all can use it. Behind the building is a 10-meter antenna, which sits underneath a ray dome. That's R-A-D-O-M-E, ray dome. We're going to take Eyes on Earth on location to learn more about the antenna and ray dome and how they fit into the Landsat story. And the best person to take us on this tour is Mike O'Brien, the ground station engineer. You've been around antennas like this for a while. Yep, I've been working on these antennas for 40 plus years. Um, I've worked on them on every continent on the planet, Antarctica included. So I'm familiar with the antenna and, and the structures and how they work and operate. You've been to the other Landsat ground stations? Uh, absolutely. Um, did most of the installation at the other Landsat ground stations called the LGN Landsat Ground Network, Fairbanks, Alaska, Svalbard, Norway, Neustrelitz, Germany, and Alice Springs, Australia. Were you here when the Eros antenna was installed? I was. We installed the antenna in 1996. It was um, immediately destroyed that spring by a hailstorm, which destroyed the reflector and all the electronics. So we had to rebuild it again that following year in 97 in February. It was really cold. And then we uh, installed the antenna. But at that point, because the hail had destroyed the first one, that's why we got the radome to protect the antenna from uh, the elements here in South Dakota. Okay, well, let's start heading out the back door. Okay. We'll talk as we walk a little bit more. Um, so we rebuilt the antenna in 1997, um, and then we installed the radome, as you can see, that's over the, the antenna. I mean, and we'll talk more about that as we get out to the, um, to the antenna site itself. But just, you know, so you can see that the antenna is, is covered. And we also have a five meter antenna, which you can't see because of the trees right now. One of the unintended side effects um, of putting the radome on the antenna is that the antennas, both of them stopped aging. The wear and tear from the South Dakota elements, wind, dust, dirt, birds, vermin, stopped attacking the antenna. A hail, you know. We had a problem recently in the fact that we couldn't get any of the motor or gear drive systems replaced or repaired anymore because they were so far out of production um, that we actually had to replace all the motors and gearboxes inside the uh, um, antenna structure to get something modern and supported that we could get replaced or repaired. That's an unusual thing. Usually on these antennas, you replace motors every five to seven years, depending on the environment. However, five to seven years is about the extent. Um, the, when we replaced those motors under this last uh, uh, action because of the age, um, those were the original factory installed motors, so 30 years old, you know, and they weren't even showing sign of deteriorating. You know, they were still going strong, but we just, we, we would have we ran into problems if we would have had an electronic problem. We never would have been able to get the motors repaired or replaced. So we had to replace them with something, you know, uh, uh, supportable before an accident happened. How long do we expect the antenna to last now? Um, probably till we run into this problem again in 20, 30 years when we can't get these motors repaired or replaced, we'll have to go through it again. A lot of times these antennas are installed for a single mission, for a single purpose, or used to be. So you only expected to get five to seven years out of it because that's what the mission life was. Well, with the Landsat missions, Landsat 5 lasted 30 years. It's uh, entirely foreseeable that we have this uh, antenna system out here for the next, you know, 50, 60 years. Nice. And still using it, you know, and we plan on buying, purchasing more antennas, obviously, as time goes on. But, um, yeah, we totally anticipate having this antenna for the next 40 to 60 years. So. Okay, cool. Well, we didn't count on them mowing the lawn back right, here. So let's let's yeah. start walking a little bit. How tall is the dome? It's a 60 foot ray dome. Um, so it's 60 foot plus whatever the, the 12 foot that the that it sits on the cement uh, ring wall. Okay. Early on, when we first started this project back in the late 90s, the cafeteria for the building was on the far side of the building. But then in uh, 2002, 2003, they moved it to where it is now in the middle of the building. At that time, they were putting in this parking lot because they needed a way to deliver groceries to the cafeteria, which is right here. 
when they were doing the excavating, uh, they broke some of our conduits. These manhole covers are the underneath are pull vaults. They're 12 by 12 cement rooms, basically, where the cables come in from conduits out underneath the door. And then, you know, go to another set, another set onto the antenna. So we're standing on top of those That's rooms right. at this time? Okay. Yep, yep, yep. And then when the excavators were digging and making all this level, they dug through our conduits right where the sidewalk meets the parking lot. They literally had their scoop dig through the conduits, break them apart, and then break a bunch of cables. Um, so that was pretty traumatic. Um, it's something that you joke about on a SATCOM site, but you never actually have happened because it's really catastrophic. Luckily, we recovered from it. We didn't actually even miss any data or passes. Tom Sennett and I reused some other cables and further conduits down. And we're able to re-string uh, the antenna, the communications from the antenna to the control room without losing any data. Nice. <laughs> So the data, it's coming into the antenna back there, and it comes through these conduits. That's how it gets into the building? That's correct, yep. Early on, all the trees, all the trees that we have out here were all saplings. They were all planted at the time that the antenna was planted. What has happened over time is the trees actually grew up. Now you see some big trees, well, then now they're starting to affect our data reception at the lower elevation. They do you get know, in the way of the they data? They do get in the way. Okay. Um, and when we started having this problem, we worked with the facilities group um, on to get some of the larger trees cut down. So the facilities manager came to me at the time and said, Mike, here's a roll of yellow duct tape. I want you to go put this on everything that you want cut down. So the first thing I went and put it on was the water tower. Wrap duct tape all the way around the base of the water tower because I really wanted to have that cut down. Why do you want the water tower cut down? <laughs> you can't have a worse object on a SATCOM facility than a large metal object filled with water attached to the ground. You can't see around it, you can't see through it. We have to basically, when we're tracking or transmitting, we notch out a space, you know, where we have three to four degrees on either side or above it, <laughs> so we don't, you know, cause problems. So we don't miss any data though because of the water tower, do we? Correct, we plan around it. Okay. Um, so it's, okay. it's, a, it's notched out in the overall sphere, uh, you know, hemisphere that we have here. Yeah. Um, we only lose a really small, like less than 1% of what we would normally take because okay. it's low towards the horizon anyway. When EDC was established, we did a lot of film processing. So you needed hot water, sewage processing and stuff. See, there's a reason the uh, water tower is here. That's right. And it was to support the film processing. This entire backyard was covered with solar panels that were also destroyed by the hailstorm that took out the antenna because you needed hot water for film processing. Now we've all switched to digital about the same time that hailstorm hit, so we never put the solar array back in. But it's mainly used now for the local surrounding community's water pressure. Okay, we're getting pretty close to the dome here. One of the first questions that I get asked is, is uh, the ropes. There's ropes that come down off the top of the ray dome and they tie down north near the bottom towards the ground. And a lot of people assume that that is for climbing, but it's actually for snow removal. So when the snow and ice get built up on the top and doesn't fall off, we have the young new guy come out and he has to undo the cables and then he smacks the rope onto the radome and then runs before all the ice and snow come down and smoke him on the ground. <laughs> I gotta ask you this too, if it's raining, does that interfere with the signal? Rain does interfere with the signal. Um, the frequencies that we use, it doesn't impact it too bad unless it's one of the really heavy rainstorms where you can't even see 10 feet. Um, but beyond that, um, um, the signals that we use are really impacted by the rain. Okay, what's the dome made of? The radome, this particular radome is made by a company called Raytech out of Reno, Nevada. Um, and it's made out of a fiberglass material. There's two pieces of fiberglass with a foam core sandwiched in between them. And there's 13,866 bolt pieces that hold this radome together. Um, has to be uh, subsample. We subsample the tightness of the bolts and then we get it washed and waxed every five years. And they just use a regular uh, hydrophobic wax. It doesn't have metal parts in it. You know, you can't go get Teflon and coat your radon with Teflon because it affects the signal going in and out. So you have to use a, a hydrophobic wax that it has no metal in it. Um, and that's just so the radon doesn't build up debris, you know, dust, dirt, and even snow for that matter during the winter. When it's freshly waxed, the snow and ice just slide right off on its own. Okay, we're inside the dome now, and it looks like the antenna is already moving. Yep, it's pre-positioning for a pass. 
What it is doing is it's setting up to look at the horizon where the spacecraft will come up over the horizon and then it'll start to follow it as soon as it can see it and then uh, we'll lock onto the signal of the spacecraft and follow it from beginning to end. But the antenna system builds a pre-predicted track path to kind of guess where the spacecraft is going to be. Um, so that's called program track and that's what we do in the beginning of the pass is we have a pre-calculated track um, that the antenna is going to follow until it sees the signal from the spacecraft then it locks onto the signal and uses that to follow the spacecraft to receive and send data. Are we okay to be in here? Yes, absolutely. The signals that come in from space are so weak, um, they are thousands, thousands of uh, times less than what your cell phone will put out. So it's not, it's not even, it's kind of in the background uh, universal noise. So it's not really even seeable um, or, or it wouldn't hurt humans. But and when you transmit from here, we have a 100 watt transmitter on this antenna. The transmit signal has to hit a target the size of a spacecraft 400 miles away. The spacecraft is like the size of a UPS truck. That's correct. And it's 438 miles away. Right, so the beam that we send to it is extremely well focused. So by the time that it hits the spacecraft, that beam is, you know, 60, 70 meters wide at that point. So down here, it's literally tiny. I feel safer being in here, despite the fact that there's a red light on, we but we're fine. A, most of these are designed to sit outside. So they have red lights oh, yeah. to indicate that they're transmitting. This is a Daytron three axis, 10 meter antenna that was purchased in 1996. The reason why it has three axes, I'm going to try to explain this with voice, is you have one axis that moves the antenna left or right, then you have another axis, axis that moves the antenna up and down. Now, one of the inherent problems with an antenna like that is if you were tracking passes that go directly overhead, the antenna doesn't come up and then flip back over. It has to come up and spin and come back down the same way that it went up. So the point at which it spins at the top is called a keyhole effect and you lose data there. You never want to lose data directly over your ground station because that's some of the best prime imagery. You get to see your ground station in the imagery. So you never want to do that. So what they do is they put in a third axis. That's the third point that has a built-in seven degree tilt. Now the antenna thinks that it's pointing straight up, but you can obviously see that there's a tilt in this antenna path going up. That way it only ever achieves 83 degrees and you don't lose data at the keyhole. Inside of the uh, reflector itself, the reflector is extremely smooth. It's 10, or 10 meters. It weighs about 8,000 pounds. There's 8,000 pounds of counterweights on the back side of the antenna. It makes this antenna extremely well balanced. I can move this antenna around with my hands when I turn off the brakes. There's two structures I want to point out at inside of the reflector. There is a large structure that is attached to the reflector itself. That's where all the image data is received. That's a higher frequency. Um, so all the pictures that we, that we get come through that structure. Now, at the end of the four bars, there's another smaller structure out here, and that is the S-band feed, or the low rate. And we do command and control here. Um, so we check the spacecraft's temperature, voltages. We tell the spacecraft when we want it to turn on, when we want it to turn off, all that stuff. All that happens through the low rate, which is the structure out at the end of the four legs here. I also see that we're standing on a significant portion of cement. How far down does this base go? That's a, that's a good question. Um, originally, we put the antenna in. When you do an antenna of this size, nine meter or larger, um, you go down 30 feet or until you hit bedrock. Um, in this case, we hit bedrock at 29 and a half feet, so we were right there either way. So that cement pad runs that whole depth, 29 and a half feet right down to bedrock. And inside of the radome, there is a set of 16 or 24 um, steel rods that go the length, the 29 and a half feet, and then their threads stick up through the bottom of the radome, and that's, bolt, that's how it's bolted to the ground. So it's extremely well attached to the ground. The, the raid, or I mean the antenna pedestal itself. You were talking about the backup antenna that's smaller. It's a five meter antenna. What is that one used for? That's correct. Originally, it's a five meter, 5.4 meter antenna from Viasat. Um, we originally purchased the antenna to support Terra, Aqua, and Aura for MODIS direct reception. Okay, these are NASA Earth oh, observing that's satellites. That's right. And then, and it was for, for started from the Ohio View project that eventually morphed into America View. Um, and then we supported a lot of college institutions. Um, it is reconstructed.
positioning to go back to stow, which is its uh, easiest position of rest. That's why we point them up like that, because it's the least amount of stress on any given part. Okay, yeah, the antenna was moving back into its birdbath position, I think you call it. Yes, that's what the operators have turned it, or termed it. Um, technically, it's called the stow, um, because it, it, when these antennas sit outside, they have something called a stow pin, that if you come up to a hurricane or a tornado or, or heavy environmental that you want, you can put in these large pins that hold the antenna steady. They go through the structure, the support structure itself, and hold it steady, and they're called stow pins. So this position is technically called stow, but yes, everybody calls it bird bath. <laughs> That's what it ends up looking like. Well, we're gonna real quick go into the ground station's operations room and talk about what happens in there. Okay, we're inside the ground station and Mike, honestly, there's a lot of monitors here. What's going on? <laughs> okay, this is where the magic happens. This is the ground, ground station operations room. So. Um, the guys in here run the passes, so uh, every time we can see a spacecraft, these guys are on board. Um, every time something needs to be done, images need to be processed, resent, packaged, whatever, um, these are the guys that do it. We have a front row of monitors here, and these are the monitors that are attached to the systems that control the antenna. This particular one to my right is the one that is the, controls the 10 meter antenna um, that we were just at, and you can see on the monitors here, this is the antenna we were just at. And okay, we see, we see a, a video of what it looks like inside the radome. Right, I forgot to turn off the lights. Um, and then this, this other monitor is the five meter antenna. We're, we have the ground station control system. So during a given pass, which the next pass is uh, 17, 17, in about 15 minutes, we'll have a Landsat 9 pass um, and we'll have to get out of the way because the operations guys will come in here they monitor all the receive signal levels and the data that the spacecraft's outputting, whether it be imagery or command and control, health and welfare. Okay, so the stuff on the monitors will mean something to them. That's correct. Okay. And they'll be right on top of it. That's so good. if something looks out of the window, then they, they either handle it themselves or give me a call. One of the stories that I like to tell when we're in here is early on in the Landsat 7 days, it took three days to process a received piece of data. I'm in that three days, if you found out at the end of the third day that there was a piece of equipment bad, you know, you went three days capturing nothing but bad data for three days. And that was horrible. I mean, that caused problems. We didn't like that at all. So we had a set of smart people come up with a way to show us the data as it was being received, showing the live imagery. At the time, it was unheard of because, you know, the processing power requirements just kind of weren't there. So, so we had this uh, new tool called Moving Window Display that showed the data as it was being received. So that way the operator could say, hey, that looks like image data, or no, nope, there's something wrong, you guys need to do something. Well, technology's moved a long way since then. And now we're able to do that with, a, with hardly any processing power, and we can share it with the general public. And there's a free USGS government website, earthnow.usgs.gov, that anybody can go to and see live imagery as it comes down from the spacecraft. In the interim, when there is no live imagery, like right now, for instance, there is no pass going on, it'll play a recorded file that happened earlier today, and then that way it's always moving and showing people stuff. Moving around to the back side of the room, um, and there is just a lot more monitors, and most of the monitors deal with the processing of the Landsat imagery once it's been received, and then the distribution and archive of that data. Um, so we kind of set up different environments. You have a Landsat 7, Landsat 8, and a Landsat 9 processing system, and then we have a dev. And that way the operators can sit here and they can see how things are processing. Um, if there's any errors, the errors will come up as red messages. Um, and then they just keep an eye on this stuff to make sure that it's all being processed and entering the archive. I mean, that's the most important thing is that it gets to the archives. Right. And beyond that, um, we have different tools and different setup for different uh, levels of processing, which I won't get into, that's another podcast. Um, but we process the data to different levels, so the rest of the monitors are for the different tools and um, things that the different scientists use, which I'm not familiar with. That's okay, we have plenty of podcasts that describe what we do with all of this perfectly processed and calibrated Landsat data. Getting accurate data from Landsat counts on all of these ground station systems working properly, including the 10 meter antenna here at Eros. Thank you, Mike, for leading us on this entertaining tour of the radome. And thank you listeners for joining us on Eyes on Earth. 
You can find all our shows on the USGS Eros website. You can also follow Eros on Facebook or Twitter to find the latest episodes or to subscribe on Apple or Google Podcasts. This podcast. This podcast. This podcast. This podcast. Is a product of the U.S. Geological Survey, Department of Interior.